Sorry. So before we begin, um, the Osgoode Township Museum acknowledges that our museum located in Vernon, Ontario, just south of Ottawa, is on the traditional unceded ancestral land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Algonquin Anishinaabe are the original inhabitants of this territory along the Ottawa, Rideau, and Castor rivers and have lived on this land since time immemorial. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Um, and this is particularly salient with the topic of tonight's talk and, and Sarah will be mentioning it later as we get into her remarks. So the museum uh, itself is located in the community of Vernon, Ontario. It is in the southernmost part of Ottawa uh, and has been operating as a museum since 1973. This is our 50th birthday year. Um, the museum opened to visitors for the first time in September 1973. Um, and we tell the story of Ottawa's agricultural and rural heritage in the former Osgoode Township. Uh, if you visit the Osgoode Township Museum during the spring, summer, or fall, you'll get a chance to wander around the grounds, visit the 10,000 square foot heritage garden that is modeled after a 1907 school garden. The main museum building houses an eclectic collection of approximately 10,000 artifacts. And these artifacts in the collection range from 3D objects, uh, such as everyday household items, from potato masher to full-size tractors and threshing mills. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, this talk is scheduled to be approximately an hour long, which includes a short time set aside at the end for you to ask questions. You can type your questions into the chat throughout the presentation and we will read them to our speaker to answer at the end. The talk is being recorded and will be uploaded to the museum's YouTube page for access later. So on your screen, um, you should see a poll now should pop up here for you. Um, please take a moment to answer the poll so that we know how many people are joining us today from your group. Thank you so much. We use these statistics um, to for grants and that sort of thing, so they're really important for us. Thank All right, you. so uh, tonight we are joined by Sarah Cooper Godoy. Sarah is a local resident who has always been interested in old dusty books and small ink scribbles on the page. Uh, she spent some considerable time transcribing the original document that she's going to discuss tonight and is happy to share her findings with the extended community and we're very glad to have the opportunity to host her while doing so. All right, that sounds great. So Caitlin, should I press, press uh, end poll or will you do that? Okay. All right, people, just there's a little, uh, just a little problem getting, I'm sure that you are now seeing this poll there we go. All right. Um, thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for logging in to hear this talk about uh, my latest little passion. So I'd like to talk to you about a really interesting old document that's called uh, or we titled the 1822 Field Notes of Osgoode Township. Um, you might be wondering what what are field notes and who wrote them and why would anyone really be interested in something that's exa almost exactly 200 years old. Well, first of all, field notes contain measurements of land, um, and I'm going to be explaining that to you in a minute, but um, they also in this particular case contain some of the earliest formal records of uh, pre-European settlement forests in our area. So it's a great historical record of what this land um, here looked like 200 years ago or earlier. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit first uh, in the first part of the presentation about the process of surveying and then what is a survey, why they're done, who did this type of work, and then I'm going to um, share with you the information in this particular field notebook and why it's still interesting to us today. 
So first, a teeny, a, a very short, uh, who am I? Why would I, you know, why am I talking to you about this? So um, I have a, a background in English and uh, ESL. I love books and I'm basically very fond of trees. Um, where am I from? I'm... <laughs> I'm a local, um, I grew up locally, and my parents were immigrants to this area, and I played in, you know, our family forest, which what happens to be in Osgoode Township. Uh, I first heard about this particular resource, the Field Notes uh, book of 1822, when I took a course in wetland management and restoration, and the instructors mentioned that these records were kept uh, not only about uh, the lots and concessions, but also they had a lot of uh, botanical information. So I was interested in that. And I asked Archives Canada um, if they had a copy for Osgoode Township, and they sent me the PDF right away for free. So I'm interested because I'm curious, and I, I know this area quite well now. And I wanted to know more about the history of local forests, how they might have changed, and um, what could this document tell us about where we are all living today. So I thought to myself, I will just make a simple transcription, which is to say copy from the book. And, um, you know, several years later, here I am. So First, I should explain what field notes are because I, I didn't really know till I went to the course that I mentioned. Um, I don't actually have a copy of the book, but I have a PDF. Um, and I imagine it's not a particularly large book because these books were carried uh, as the survey was being done. Uh, and it's um, this, in fact, one that I was sent in the PDF might be a copy because uh, I imagine they might have like scrawled on it, you know, by campfire and it might the first original one might have been a little dirty and dusty. This one seemed to be written very tidily. Um, so field notes are detailed records of a survey. And at the minimum, they have, as you can see in the picture there, um, the lots and the concession numbers, which are the um, for people that don't know, it would be the, the roads that were being surveyed, and then the measurements between the posts that as they're surveying. And the survey notebooks did not belong to the surveyor. They were belonged to the um, organization, or in this case, the government, who paid for that work to be done. And the most interesting part for me, uh, again, is the part on the side of the page, which said remarks. And this is where other geographical information is recorded. So it could include types of trees, water features, soil quality, and things like that. And that's what I was really interested in. So I can hear maybe some of you thinking, hey, wait, what, what exactly is a survey? So if survey notes are products of surveys, what, what is the survey itself? Well, a survey is still and was um, a scientific way of gathering data, which is used in map making. So even today, if you're severing a piece of land on your from your property, um, you need you or your lawyers will be referring to a survey. So um, the primary result of these old surveys was to put lines on land uh, for ownership, and we need to recognize that in 1822. The survey, this particular survey was being made for made by and funded by the colonial government of the day, and it was being used to formalize land ownership by settlers. And so with respect, we must remember uh, that very often that land which was being surveyed at the time of this um, of this particular survey, this land had not been clearly uh, or fairly purchased necessarily, and sometimes had not even been treated for uh, by the people doing the survey. So uh, the original Indigenous peoples um, were not uh, treated fairly. So we must also admit and acknowledge that surveys were and are still often used to impose power or control of by one group of people over another, and also on the natural environment. And so, um, as James mentioned, the land in Osgood Ward is unseated still by the Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe peoples. See if I can try to get rid of that little thing off the front there. 
maybe, uh, Caitlin, maybe you can uh, take that toolbar off the top of the slide for me. Don't know if you know how to do that. Um, so keeping that political atmosphere in mind, why was this particular survey being done in 1822? So in a nutshell, there was need for the land to be cut into lots um, to be granted or sold to newcomers in the area. So a very, very brief history at the time, south of what did not exist, the, U the border. In the US, the War of Independence had started in 1775. And at that time, this area was being governed by the British Empire. And the, the government of the time had promised those who supported the British in the losing side in the US that they could come up to, up to um, Upper Canada and they would be granted land for free. So this, this painting is not from the period itself, but it does represent uh, the process, uh, certainly initially, that land was just granted. And again, I need to remind you all that this was not necessarily land that belonged to the people who were granting it. Um, so this land was granted by lot, um, lottery to people. Uh, who were United Empire loyalists. Uh, so that was um, one of the reasons that the land needed to be, uh, they decided that, that they would obviously need some maps to organize um, giving out this land. Another reason that these surveys were being taken was that there was a, a large demand for lumber. And so these surveys with the remarks, field remark, the remarks about trees um, were going to help uh, businesses or businessmen um, know where they should possibly be buying land uh, because they wanted lumber for, um, for the, uh, the ships. The, and this is just an illustration again from the period. and. Um, we need to remember that ships were used for everything then, for business and for transport and for war. So there was a big, big demand. And basically Europe had already stripped all of their land, their much of their fields, their lands of trees. And so now they turned to North America to get more. So who was doing this surveying? And here we have some great illustrations. Again, not quite from the period, but uh, certainly um, pretty accurate, one would assume. Um, even someone who lives in this area now, we can recognize uh, some of the scenes. The uh, gentleman on the left is standing you know, up to his ankles or more in water, trying uh, to, we can see he has a, uh, one of the tools that is used for surveying in those days. And you see he's surrounded by mosquitoes. Well, this is pretty accurate, I would say. Um, and um, we can see that surveying at that time was uh, obviously, and still now, is done out in the bush, on out in the land. It's quite a hard job even now with GPS and stuff. So on the right, we see that um, many surveys were done in the winter. Uh, we see that people are wearing snowshoes. They have Indigenous people helping them uh, carry their gear and also undoubtedly helping them uh, not get lost uh, because um, the forest was very dense in those days. Uh, the group of people that would do the survey was called a party, a survey party, and they would be led by a deputy surveyor and they would have axemen and chainmen. These were the several of the uh, titles of the jobs that people were hired in at to do. Um, and as I said, often the team would include Indigenous peoples who knew the area. And there are contemporary records of Indigenous people strongly objecting to the survey process. Um, for example, in one case in Southern Ontario, they uh, formally uh, objected saying that they had made a treaty with the French who at that earlier had owned or, you know, had as a colony uh, Southern Ontario, and that now the land was being surveyed by different people. Um, so they, we realized that this is still an issue today. Um, and some of these surveys are referred to um, in the negotiations uh, that are ongoing now with the government to resolve our uh, issues with Indigenous peoples. And there's, there are quite a few, I found online, quite a few um, contemporary diaries uh, which have been published from those days of the challenge of trying to survey um, in the bush. 
So who really did the work? Um, well, like many um, businesses, even now, often the people who won the contract didn't necessarily go out into the field, um, especially in later years. Politicians or businessmen would win the contract to do the survey, and then they would subcontract it out, even though their names were often on the, the map, which would be the final product. Um, and here on the right, you can see there is a great um, little extract from a diary of um, a journal that someone kept in 1819. So this is very, very close to the time that our survey in this township was done. And um, the poor surveyor is just like try to get his team together and get out there working. Um, and if you just skim through it, you can see uh, there's several mentions of whiskey, uh, which are uh, definitely required to get his team together and, uh, you know, um, on, out in the field. He provides them down, if you look um, uh, on the 23rd um, or the 22nd, rather, he gets some snowshoes. He goes back to town. Um, he finds uh, two of his team there, his party, with a keg of whiskey. He sends them back out to the field. Presumably, he's going to join them later. And when he goes the next day, he goes out and, and says, I found all my party squibby, having drunk up my whiskey and their own, and they had not moved the camp. So I think that um, survey party was not far from the truth sometimes. Um, it was very, it was very hard work. So on the left here, we see a list of some of the gear that the people would have, that this particular team uh, party took out in the field with them. There was one surveyor, two chainmen, and I'm going to talk about the equipment they use. They're, they hold either end of the measuring chain and four axemen. And the reason I'm sure you can guess um, that they need axemen is that when you're in a forest and you need a line of sight, there uh, there is a lot of um, of chopping of trees and they have to be kept sharp uh, as well. Um, so that is a very, very um, hard job. So the technology, I, I'm not a surveyor, obviously. I'm not a surveyor, um, so, but I've read around the topic a lot. And um, at this time in 1822, the most basic um, tools were used for surveying, uh, including a, a compass, which was often on a, on a mount, like on a tripod, and um, a chain, basically. And the chain was a standard length. And so uh, one gunter chain is 66 feet long. And this is still... Um, why some of our uh, road allowances here in the city of Ottawa, uh, you, if you measure them, you, you see that they're 66 feet, which seems a random number, but it's, it's not because it's one chain um, wide. So this reason that these, uh, this particular chain was adopted um, as a standard measurement um, earlier, like internationally, because uh, 10 square chains equals one acre. And so this was uh, because acres is was at that time, the um, uh, shape of measurement that we were imposing on the land. Um, obviously, they, the 10 chains equal one acre was a very um, nice, a nice, neat decimal kind of system to use. Um, on the right in this, uh, the practical surveyor was very, um, a uh, well-respected reference book at the time. It was uh, edited and um, over time, different editions were published. And um, people at that time learned to be surveyors um, by study, but also much like many trades now by apprenticeship. And, in, and also it seems that um, often a surveyor would be uh, the son of a surveyor. So just like now, you know, you. Uh, you might do what your uh, your family trade. So axemen would clear the line of sight, and the chainmen. You notice there were two chainmen. The chain would the chainmen would stretch out the chain, and then posts were driven in, or in many cases trees were blazed. So they didn't actually carry posts. I think I think they blazed the trail, which is to say they cut um, marks on trees along that along that um, line. So 
what exactly is a township? Because um, the it's called the field notes of a the township of Osgood. Um, and some people may not know what a township is nowadays. Um, so a township at that time is, was a geographical area, but also at that time, it was also a political area. That's not the case now. Uh, many townships have been uh, have been amalgamated or absorbed into urban cities. But in those days, a township was your political world and it was also like a geographical area. And when the political decision was made to uh, divide up land into pieces of township to, in order to give them to or grant them to um, all these new refugees coming from the states and from other countries, um, at first, apparently, the model was to create lots of 120 acres, sort of a random 120, uh, I guess, seemed like a good number. But um, in England, uh, the decision was made to hand out land in 50 acre pieces. And as we know, uh, as I explained, the, the Gunter chain like lends itself to that decimal system. So the pattern uh, for townships became a uh, a thousand acres in a concession. So a typical Ontario township was to be was to be 10 miles wide with 10 concession roads and would create blocks of five rectangular lots, 200 acres, and they would lie between surveyed uh, roads and side roads. So on the right, on the left hand side, you can see the um, this sort of the ideal measurements. And on the right hand side, this is from Osgood Township. And I think if you look, you can see the double lines which make the road. So this is one um, to make the road. So you can see there's a square there. And I'm going to try this new little feature here. Hold on. So here we see this is one concession, one full concession. This is the thousand acres. And in this concession over time, because this map is from 1879, uh, the land was, uh, so, some of the lots were divided. So we see here it's 50 acres and 50 acres and 100. But originally the original lot would have been 200 acres. And the crazy kind of thing was that um, uh, in those days, regardless of rivers, streams, ridges, the roads were all to be straight. Um, and we can imagine this was quite uh, difficult for surveyors because they they weren't allowed to like go around. They had to go straight over. So that's the minor digression in this in my story about surveying is that um, this was all, uh, you know, the plan was to a lot land to people in an orderly fashion and uh, grant certain people were entitled to certain amounts of land. But sometimes this was all um, went awry when uh, you might arrive to your property that you'd been granted and there would be a squatter and squatters showed up and moved onto lands without going through the government's process at all. So there is a record of one, at least one of these incidents in Osgood Township. So here on this slide, I have um, letters from the representatives of both of these two families. Um, George Latimer on the left, George Latimer's um, representative is uh, writing a letter to the court saying that, uh, explaining that George arrived on his lot, he was given it, he he saw there was a squat a man there who'd already done some work, and he paid him some money to leave. That's what George says. And then on the right-hand side, Hugh Matthews says that, in fact, he was paid money, but that was in recognition of the work he'd done, ergo, it was his lot now. So um, this case went on for a, a year or more. And in the end, the court did decide that perhaps George should be given another piece of land. So obviously Hugh's lawyer did better than George's. And in fact, their family land was not a, um, uh, did, did not go, it was lot 14 and then lot, uh, sorry, lot 15 and then lot 14 on the other side. So it looks like Hugh actually was able to stay um, in the land that he started to clear. And this picture below is a picture of what they mean when they say a shanty. It would have been the first type of house that a person would have built in those days, cutting down trees, obviously. And you just had to make some kind of a, 
uh, shelter to, to make it through the winter. So just a quick review here on this map. There's a lot of maps when you're talking about surveying uh, to show where old Osgood Township is, because now we are part, um, politically, we are in the city of, uh, municipally, we're in the city of Ottawa, and politically, we're in Osgood Ward. So this is the current map, obviously. And um, Osgood Township, the land that I'm speaking about and is um, included in the field notes is um, the North Road is Mitch Owen. Um, Boundary Road is on the right on the east side. And on the south would be Marionville and Bellmead Road, I think. And then on the on the west is it is bounded um, by not a straight uh, line, in fact, because major rivers like this is the Rita River, um, they did not they did not ideally want to put a township on either side. And so it just worked out that that this township, ours, is not a completely perfect um, rectangle. So what do the field notes actually look like? And this, of course, is my favorite part. Um, it's a small little leather booklet, a book, as we said. The information is in columns. Um, and the picture's not super great. Um, this document has been microfilmed uh, and actually was microfilmed in 1940. So um, great technology of those days. Um, you can see the numbers. So uh, you can see the numbers on the far left of each page would be the lot numbers. And then you can see they, they measured the chains. And then there's an L for the links because the Gunter chain is actually divided, subdivided into links as well for measurements. Now, as the survey party was trudging through the bush, hacking down trees and trying not to get frostbite, they also, their role was to spin around every once in a while and note the different types of trees that they could see. So this is what becomes the scientific record of the pre-European settlement forest in our area. Now, we have to remember they only noted trees that were of financial significance or use. So nowhere in this book does it say apple tree, but there were apple trees. Um, so, um, so it's the key trees that, but these are still trees that we would consider to be very um, useful and beautiful trees. They also would record uh, water levels in streams, any streams that they crossed, and the width of water courses. And in that management course, water wetland management course that I was taking, they did refer to those as records of water flow in the past, because those uh, water flow has changed over the years with deforestation. Um, so if this is also can be very interesting data for scientists to look at now to see how water levels have changed over time. So after the survey was completed, what's amazing to me is that all these written notes are then transformed by cartographers into a map, which then would show the lot lines, the roads, the waterways, and in the very early maps, they also wrote the types of trees. So in this particular book, um, the field notes, uh, there are actually 12 sets of data. There's one set of data for each line that was surveyed. So this map, um, I just used the 1879 map, but it's the same area. So I've, I've drawn on here the lines of the routes that the, um, that the uh, surveyors took. So here they started in this corner where the little red dot is, and then they went down, and then they went along. Anyway, you can you can get the, the gist of it. But um, in total, it was, um, I, I, I measured it. Um, it's about 180 kilometers of surveying. Um, so to clarify one point, uh, you, you'll notice there is not a line uh, on the far left. That's because initially the uh, major rivers, which would include the Ottawa and obviously the Rideau River, the strip along the, each of those rivers were actually surveyed and chopped up and deforested and, and settled um, earlier. 
in, in uh, 1794, in fact, the survey was done of that particular strip of, of what became our township. Um, that's because obviously for transportation, uh, when people first arrived, there were no roads and it was people traveled along the rivers and for people cutting timber, it they would chop the trees and float them down the river. So a lot of the best land uh, along the river had already possibly been settled. So the survey in 1822 was to cut up the rest of the land into, or to market into uh, those 200 acre strips. So on this map too, from 1879, which is, uh, you know, your decades later, you can see little black dots and those represent the houses of that time in 1879. And you can see that a lot of them are close to the, the black lines, which are the roads or the lines that were surveyed. So very often uh, people knew that in the future there might be a road and they would put their home uh, closer to the road than the center of their property. So what's great is that many of these lines are the same roads that you and I are driving on every day. And some of them still have the names which might have seemed boring, but now you're gonna know that they come from the surveys. So for example, uh, eighth line road runs through the middle of Metcalf. Well, that's the eighth line. That's the, li the name it was given in 1822 when it was surveyed. The eighth line, the ninth line boundary road, many, all townships have a boundary road. Um, and when you travel across the province, you're going to come across these roads, um, similar names, because each township, the whole province, the southern part of the province was cut up into the very same uh, shape with the very same distances, but often between these roads. So um, now some roads, the names have been changed, obviously, um, to, with because it's more uh, attractive to have, I guess, a name, uh, and also to avoid duplication. You don't want to have, for fire um, reasons, fire safety, you don't want to have um, two eight-line roads, say, in the city of Ottawa. That would be dangerous or confusing. So even now, um, as you know, if you're a rural person, um, not all these roads may have been opened. So you might have heard of the term of an unopened road allowance, but that would be the same strip of land that was surveyed in our, in our township it would be in 1822. And it's still often sitting there unopened, but marked for future road um, development. And in many cases, the city of Ottawa still uh, owns a lot of those old surveyed strips for future planning for development. And you can see these, um, if you look on Geo Ottawa, which is a really good um, uh, mapping website that's free online. So this is the beautiful, beautiful map that um, was produced uh, from the first uh, the first map that I could find that was produced from the book with all the data. So if you look at it for a little while, get your eyes used to it, you can start to see that there's quite a lot of blue, which would be the, um, we can see on the left, the Rideau River, and then we can see on the right um, here, I'm just going to use this, these would be the branches of the Castor River here which still exists and runs, but possibly not as wide maybe as it was in those days. And also you can see a lot of this, this kind of pale blue area on our township. See how so much of our township of this map has that blue underlying area, which represents swampland. And so um, this, this uh, just sort of reinforces what all of us might know about this township, that it's always been very wet. Historically, it's been wet and it still is. And also you might not know that, um, of course, uh, no computers in those days, uh, these maps would be very large and uh, they were also used to record ownership over time. So on this map, uh, there's a lot of gaps, but you can start to, in some places, you can see some names and that would be, um, that would be the owner or the person who's been granted the, the land or bought, um, not maybe bought the, the land. 
And on the right, I just uh, did put a little clip there of the tree data that the cartographer added um, by each lot. And he's put here, um, you know, maple, beech, elm. So a person looking at that map would be able to see what type of trees possibly were, uh, were growing on the land that, he, that they've been granted. Um, so that's pretty amazing. So I want to show you a detail again of this beautiful, beautiful map. This is, uh, was on the side of the map, and this was the title. And then the cartographer has just, uh, because this little piece is not actually part of the township and doesn't have any lot lines, um, he's just drawn this really beautiful scene here with large trees. And we can see um, really close up this, this I think is a wolf. And he when I look at it close on my um, computer and really blow it up, it appears to be smelling a flower, which I find very sweet. Um, there's a squirrel on the side of the tree. There are birds in the in the sky. Um, there are dog wolves or dogs running around. So um, the cartographers are often uh, were very artistic as well, obviously, and. Here um, is where we get the information. We can see that uh, William McDonald is listed here as the surveyor, and uh, we have his name. So this is how I know that William McDonald did the survey. So um, his name is also listed in the front of the field notes. And um, so we know that he was the head surveyor of of the uh, township, of this uh, survey. Now, interestingly, uh, we know also that he worked on other surveys in uh, Charlton Bird, Picton, and also um, the township of Russell. And I, I tried to find out a little more about him, but sadly, um, well, not sadly, um, the name McDonald and McDonnell were often interchangeably written in those days. And so it, it's really difficult to do any genealogical kind of investigation without a lot more uh, clues. What's interesting is that there is a record of him in the archives about him complaining about this particular contract with Osgoode Township and Russell. It seems that he bid for it and was granted the contract. And then in this letter, he complains that he hadn't really realized that you know, the best strip, as I mentioned, along the side of the Rideau River had already been surveyed, ergo all and the best pieces of land given away. And also, he's heard that Osgoode Township is quite, um, here, where does it say? Uh, oh, the, the lands in these townships are generally understood to be very swampy and consequently very difficult to survey, which is probably an understatement. So he, in these this, uh, letters, he asked for more money more uh, to pay. He asked for two and a half percent increase for the work. And this record show that he was paid um, possibly up to 5,000 5, acres of land for the survey and, the, and also for the Russell Township survey. And in those days in 1822, I found it really interesting that um, people were paid in land. The surveyors originally were paid in cash, but by 1822, the government was pretty cash poor, so they were paid in land. And so obviously, uh, if you did the survey and you had access to the, the, the sort of master map, you would know which pieces of land to ask for in your payment. So they could choose land that was possibly, you know, where they knew the best timber was in that township or where the best site on a river what would be for a mill or for a crossing. So it's a little, sounds a little scandalous to me, uh, but that was the uh, way it was done in those days. And this map here, I've just circled um, all the uh, blocks of land that are owned, uh, the names are written. Remember, I told you the owners of the land are written on each lot. And the ones I've circled are all um, W.M. McDonald, which I feel must be the surveyor. Uh, 22 blocks of 100 acres. So basically, that's a holding of 2,200 acres of land. Um, so that was very common uh, to be paid in land. And um, 
also what happened was they wouldn't actually hold that land for very long they would then turn around and sell it um as they needed money um and so that was how that was done so this is the part that um that i find really interesting as well which is why would we now care about this information and what could we do with it so as i mentioned there's a lot of scientific data in this in this field notebook um after i transcribed it um i i copied it all you know trying to read the words the best i could and i put it into a word document and then using uh, just a simple search word search feature if you count all the different terms you can get a picture of the features of the land so i kind of grouped them uh and this is on the right here you can see um the most of the references were to trees a lot there were a, a lot of mention of water because as we see in the map we have uh, three branches of of a river uh, going through the township they mentioned landscape vegetation and um a little bit about the soil so here we have um there were 102 times they mentioned swamps so um Again, we're, we're not super surprised if we're local people. And even when you see uh, build new construction in um, much of the parts of the outer part of um, uh, the southern part of Ottawa that is growing into, into Oscar Township or north of us just a bit, it's very wet. And this is how it was in that time as well. And also there were references to beaver ponds and um, that would be typical. They beavers uh, create swamps or you know there's a biological interaction there other than water there were uh, quite a few references uh, 68 words actually relating to landscape uh, most of them uh, ma the majority to ridges so we we do have highlands as well in this township so hills and things and also, they mentioned, um, interestingly, beaver meadows, which is the stage as a land goes from a beaver pond to it goes to a beaver meadow as it slowly fills in. So these words I find just interesting, the description that they the surveyors made as they were trudging through. Uh, the next group of words I kind of grouped together uh, at, for vegetation, other than the actual names of trees, were, um, they mentioned sometimes if there were saplings, I, and I don't know why, but I guess just to indicate that there were not uh, mature trees in that particular area. And uh, 13 times they mentioned windfalls, which I find really interesting because the, what they what that refers to is an area where uh, really like the Dedecho that came through the windstorm that came through this year, um, an area where a lot of trees have just been knocked down by a sudden burst of wind. So it's just it would be a mess to walk through uh, surveying, dragging a chain, and it would also um, mean that possibly the wood would not be the timber would not be useful for um, possibly for sale. And then, um, not surprisingly, again, for people who've ever tried to plant a tree north of Metcalf, um, south of Metcalf, we have a great farming land, but um, only 14 words out of 2000, whatever, referred to the soil. And the majority of them, you see proportionally there in my little picture, say that it's stony. So only once in the entire book does it say that there's fine uh, black, beautiful black soil, only once in the whole township. So again, this um this does possibly support, you know, the the um the fact that or it helps us understand that it has always been stony in this area. So the best data of all, the part that I think you might be interested in and that you can uh you might uh, be able to refer to in the future is that um, there were many references to trees uh, and to varieties of trees. So I was interested to know what types of trees grew here. So there were 17 varieties of trees were listed in, uh, you know, obviously multiple times. Um, and I did a little statistical thing and um, 58% of those were deciduous trees, and the other 42 were coniferous trees. So that's like 
sort of almost 50-50. As I mentioned earlier, remember, not there were other trees obviously growing, but this um, these trees that I'm going to talk to you about just briefly now are the ones that were probably of financial or practical use to the people of that time. So why do why would you be interested in knowing what these 17 varieties are? Well, because these are the ones that you would want to plant now if you want to reforest this area of Osgood Township, former Osgood Township, if you want to use native trees that were successfully growing here in the pre-European settlement forest days. So I'm going to now tell to run through what the top 10 trees of 1822 were. So I'm going to show you 10 slides now, this final part of the presentation. And I just want to point out at the top of the slide is the, the word as it appeared in the um, multiple, multiple times, as it appeared in the field notes. So it took me a little while for my eyes to get used to reading them. Um, and some of the writing was harder to um, to uh, read than others, written in ink, of course. Um, and then the uh, along where I hear, for example, a, a cedar tree, and when I've put the description of what it might be used for, some of these descriptions, if I've put them in um, uh, italics, or yeah, italics, um, uh, is because I got them from contemporary diaries or travel logs of the time. Otherwise, I just looked at the um, some tree books. And the pictures at the bottom are from a very nice website, which you all might be interested in, called the Ontario Tree Atlas. So uh, cedar trees, we, we know, are, were used for fencing. I've, I have not put here, but obviously for building shingles, boats, and canoes. Uh, this type of wood is, is uh, pretty much rot resistant. So it was very good for, uh, for fence posts. Some of the posts uh, still on properties that I'm, I'm familiar with, the posts still stand 200, 150 years later, the posts are still there. They haven't rotted, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So cedar tree was the mentioned the most in the um in this field notebook uh 14 percent of the references were to cedar the next uh popular tree or, or common tree is the elm tree and this is a bit sad really because as many of us know this tree is no longer in our communities hardly any exist and uh, the few that do um, are either very very old or young ones but they die uh, prematurely because of uh, the the uh, dutch elm disease this wood is is known for being particularly hard it actually bends nails when you try to hammer into it and was used for furniture boxes crates barrels that was the second most mentioned tree, maple tree, and it might have been also red maple, but sugar maple uh, was uh, appeared a lot in this area. And we know it was used for building, but um, also, of course, for maple syrup, but it's a very good lumber for building as well. Beech trees, number four. Uh, they have a lot of nuts, which uh, in those days people might have actually gathered for eating. Um, also used for furniture, handles, wooden wear. That's number four. Fir trees. Um, it's a, it's a soft wood, um, but it was also used apparently um, here in italics um, for spruce beer, a beverage in high request amongst the Canadians. Uh, perhaps the survey parties were very particularly fond of this. As we know, they drank a lot of whiskey sometimes. Um, so this was the fifth uh, most mentioned tree in the in the field notes. Hemlock, again, another coniferous tree, was mentioned a lot. Um, you can build with it. It's a soft wood. Um, and also it was used for medicines and tea. The seventh most popular or common tree, I should say, was the ash tree, which again is no longer really viable in our area at all. Um, 
but in those days it was uh it was used although this uh you see here in italics the um author of that particular book that I was uh, looking at, the contemporary book, uh, kind of uh, did not feel that ash was a very good wood, not a very serviceable wood, um, but it was used for furniture. But now this tree does, does, um, is mostly dying out across our area. The eighth most mentioned tree is basswood, which is lightweight um, and easily worked for sleighs and carriages. <laughs> according to the local, um, according to the uh, contemporary description. And interestingly, when, if you look at the, um, uh, the transcription here, you see that they, uh, it doesn't look, it took me a while to see that it was the letter, this is the letter B, A, and then it's a double S. So they do that thing that they did in those days where they don't put SS, they put like a, almost like a letter F beside it. So that took me a while to decipher that it was actually a bass tree, a bass tree. Birch, which was hard to read because it looks a lot like beech tree. So it took me a while to be able to, sometimes I, I was, couldn't be 100% sure that I was transcribing correctly. Um, the birch tree was the ninth most prolific tree in this area. Very useful timber, timber and, uh, and beautiful canoes, which I think we all have heard about um, birch bark canoes. And the, the tenth uh, tree was the pine tree. So this was used for building houses, um, barrel staves, masts, and also resin can be extracted from pine trees, which was used for uh, apparently for boats and other purposes, which I confess I'm not familiar with. So I don't know if these are the other, the um, those that didn't make the top 10 list, the other seven types of trees that were that were mentioned in the uh, diary, or diary, sorry, in the uh, field notes. I wonder if you're able to read them there, if you don't, I'll give you just like a second to read them. What I found really interesting is that I, um, my favorite tree is an oak tree, and I thought that there would have been more oaks in our township, but there were not. It was, uh, here is, uh, that you can see on the, here, this is, says oak. There were not, there were not uh, very many oaks, um, certainly in the part of the township in this survey. Perhaps there were more along the Rideau River that, that had been earlier surveyed. This one says soft maple which would be a silver maple, uh, as opposed to the hard, what they considered a hard maple, which would be, um, which did make the top 10. A soft maple, they're, they're often, um, uh, the wood is not so strong. This was a balsam here, balsam fir, alder, willow. There was only one mention of willow in the entire book, uh, in the entire field notes, uh, tamarack, and larch, which are actually the same, um, can be considered the same tree, I think, uh, biologically speaking. So just this final um, little chart here, I wanted to show you that, uh, interestingly, there wasn't one tree that occurred, you know, far more than another, that really, in this area, it was quite a mixed variety of trees. Um, and certainly among the top 10 that I mentioned, um, they sort of appear in no one was, you know, 50% was one type of tree. So that's interesting to know, again, if you have a piece of property and you're, you're reforesting. I think the tendency now is not to create a whole plantation of the same type of tree, but to kind of have a mixed, um, a mixed forest is a, is a healthier uh, approach. And we can see that in 1822 and earlier, that was the case here as well. So if you are now incredibly fascinated by this, I want you to know that um, as of today, the Osgood Township Museum website has uploaded the field notes and the transcriptions. So you just need to click on uh, the tab that says our collections and you can read um, the transcription that I did. And you can also look at that document that I've been talking about today about the field notebook and see if you can read, you know, if you can decipher what trees are, are on uh, written there. 
The transcription, you can search it by lot and concession. So you, if you live in this township, in this area, and even if you live in a village, originally um, that would have been, it's in a lot that would have been originally surveyed in 200 acres, even though you might be in a subdivision. You can search and see which trees were growing there in 1822, which I think is pretty fun. And there will also be a paper copy at the museum as well for people that might be dropping by in person to see the other displays there. So this is where I'm going to wrap up. Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing about the field notes of 1822 and all those spin-off topics that come from just one old document. So to circle back to that title of the presentation, I certainly did learn a lot about surveying as I was researching. And I think we can all see from the mapping that was done as a result of that survey that this area has always been swampy. And I was really quite shocked by some of the scandals, the unseated land and the way surveyors were paid with land, which they themselves had just recently surveyed. So if you're also interested, when this uh, slide presentation will be uh, posted online, as Caitlin mentioned, and um, you will see there's an, another slide coming later at the end where there I have put some links for online resources, um, which you would just have to click on. They should be live, um, the links, if you want to read more about those topics and also the citations for the, uh, the different images that I used in this presentation. So this very last slide is a Google Earth shot of the township now, which just one more time with this little printer, which is really roughly, you know, this area here, sort of the full triangle in the middle. So um, we can see that uh, we know that 200 years ago, that was all forested. So now we can see there's a lot, quite a lot of unforested land. Now, part of this in the southern part is very successful farmland, but there are definitely areas where trees could be replanted. So now that you know, you know the top 10 of 1822, I'm going to suggest that you could replant with those varieties to help recreate the original forest cover. So I want to thank you for listening to my pandemic obsession. And if you have any questions, I think Caitlin's going to help me um, to answer those. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sarah, not only for all of your work in transcribing this document, but also for putting together this presentation in such a digestible format. Um, so I am going to go through the chat here and read some of the questions to you. Sure. Um, if that's okay. The person, I think I've clicked it. Oh, here we go. Okay. 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 Um, so there's a question here that says, did the notes mention any interaction of surveyors with Indigenous people? I love that question. That was, in fact, uh, a key point about why I wanted to read those field notes, um, because uh, in many parts of the province, the field notes would include exactly that, that they met people out while they were surveying, um, or even um, there were also maybe more um, comments about more wildlife and things. But but uh, interestingly, there was no mention, only biological, botanical things were mentioned. There was no mention of that, unfortunately, at all. So um, I guess they didn't meet up with anybody at that time while they were surveying. Um, there's another question here. Do field notes ever contain sketches of the ground? Um, oh, gosh, I, I can't say 100 percent, but I, I don't think sketches. Per, I, I, I don't think so. I think they were more measurements and then they would go back um, and take those measurements and that data and the cartographer would work with that. And, you know, they would have to figure out um, the, the stream started at one side of the lot and it was this wide. And then at the other end of the lot, the stream is still there, but it's narrower. And then the drawing would have to represent that. So yeah, I don't, I don't think there were sketches, but I couldn't say a hundred percent. There is a question here that says Stagecoach Road and Bank Street are indigenous trails. Are you aware of any other indigenous trails or canoe or portage routes? 
I am not, but I'm going to suggest uh, one of the, the uh, references that I, um, resources that I put, uh, that's interesting. I didn't, I did not know that. Um, you might want to uh, talk to the people at uh, either the South Nation Conservation Authority or the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority, because they are very familiar with um, with the land and they might know uh, particularly canoe routes and things like that. Okay, there's another question here. Were you able to link tree species with um, terrain type? Oh, I I was not. But I did put that reference, um, again, that resource is in my um, list of resources. Uh, somebody wrote a very um, detailed thesis um, in the 1990s about um, Eastern Ontario forests. And that is exactly what that woman did, was she matched uh, the trees. She did a very uh, detailed map, like, and mapped uh, trees with, um, with the terrain. Because you're right, you couldn't put a maple tree possibly in the middle of a swamp. But um, so I've just done it a sort of a more uh, uh, sweeping township wide uh, analysis. But um, it has been done, in, and that data would still be relevant today if you um, read that uh, thesis that's posted online, which I have the link to. Great. Um, how accurate were the surveying of swamps compared to where the current swamps are? Ah, well, I guess that's another thesis waiting to happen. <laughs> um, but um, it was accurate to 1822. And then what happened was as farmers, as people were granted land, of course, 99% uh, of people do not want water on their land. 99% of people, particularly in those days, who are trying to make a living, uh, you know, survive farming, you, you want that water off your land. So that uh, many, many drains have been drawn, uh, have been uh, dug, uh, all going into these major, you know, these uh, rivers. So again, South Nation Conservation Authority has some great maps that you can look at. And you can see if you click on their waterways map, I think it's called, it's just appears all blue, because you can see the original rivers, but then you can see so many little blue lines and all of those are the little drain, the drains that have been dug over time, you know, to drain land. Okay. Um, there's a question here. Um, lots of um, comments like, thank you. Thank you so much. Well done, Sarah. <laughs> I don't want to skip over those. Um, <laughs> have you been able to identify old growth forest? Ah. Well, again, there is a resource. <laughs> I don't think we have any old growth at all in the township. In fact, the thesis suggested and other things I've read suggest there is no there is no old growth forest at all in the township, which is to say it's all been cut down or has died because trees do die of just old age. Um, so there is no old growth in this township at all. Um, However, there are uh, properties that have far, uh, forests that are 100 years or 150 years, and those are recognized, for example, if a person goes to sever a piece of property, and it, it is um, one of the steps that uh, you must go through is um, there's a, an overlay that is put on that property. And if it shows that you have a piece of forest that has been there for more than a certain number of years, um, there is a, an extended process for uh, that a landowner must go through because the uh, conservation authorities and the city or the municipality would like to protect those older pieces of, of forest, such as they are, even if they're not old growth forests. Okay, um, another comment here. Thank you, Sarah. So intriguing. Um, there's a comment that says, it's a shame they didn't specify what varieties of each tree. Not all pines, for instance, would be considered native here. Ah, right. Although, I mean, in 1822, uh, that was addressed in the thesis. The woman, the, the person did address what varieties it, they might have 
what she felt varieties of trees they would be referred to by a general term like pine right but yeah um there's a comment thank you sarah fascinating research and presentation um there's a question here any surviving tree from that period still alive in the township and where Ooh. well i don't know but i'm going to put my vote in for uh there is <laughs> gorgeous old elm tree that is behind the um on the fairgrounds in Metcalf, um behind the market uh, the farmers market uh building there's a beautiful huge tree you cannot put your arms around i think we tried you know, four people so that's that's an example of a really really old tree mm -hmm. that's my there's a, a video um somewhere on youtube about that tree i think right have you seen that? Yes, there is. I, yeah. Yes, there is. <laughs> so that's the oldest tree I know. Okay, there's a question here. There's lots of questions. <laughs> um, any idea what proportion of the township is forested now? Is it increasing as farming declines? Hmm. Anecdotally, I would say it is increasing, but I do not know that statistic. But if you, um, again, anecdotally or, or just out of interest, if you look on the Geo Ottawa website, <clears throat> you can look at a piece of property and then you can um, switch the overlays so that you can then see the aerial photographs that have been taken in the last 50 years, which is still quite interesting because in 50 years, that big change has come from where a lot of land in our township was open agricultural to a lot of reforestation has happened uh, in government plans and in just individual people wanting to do that. So uh, I don't know the statistics, but I know you can have a rough look at it yourself. Like if you have a property that and you, you aren't um, familiar with the history of it, you can search that out. And that's quite fun to see. Great. Um, another comment here. Thank you. And thanks so much for the great presentation. Um, in I think I'll probably um, cut the comments off soon. Um, there's another one here in Russell Township on some concessions, the lots on the west side of the road are closer to 80 acres and on the east side are closer to 120 acres. Did this yeah. happen in Osgood Township as well? It did not, but um, I didn't mention uh, because, you know, I'm trying to honor surveyors, okay, uh, there were errors made sometimes. So that even suggests really that perhaps sometimes they would uh, perhaps did not count correctly the, the correct number of uh, chains as they were doing the bottom of the township. And so then, then that would mean when they went up, they, this, this block would be narrow, uh, you know, shorter than it should have been. And this one was longer. So that, that does happen sometimes as an error in surveying. And equally, when one township meets another, for example, when Osgood Township boundary meets the, the, the boundary of Russell Township, those lines, those roads do not meet like this. They meet like this. <laughs> because again, they, they uh, didn't maybe, there was an error made or they started just, you know, a few feet up. So that when you have jogs in roads, they were as like, two surveys met and they didn't quite meet. Uh, you know, when they joined, they didn't, um, they had started slightly off. That's so interesting. Still did a great job. Yeah. Okay, um, a comment. Very interesting concerning the old growth. Thank you. I'd like to find indigenous marker trees. Um, there's a comment here. Have you found any references to butternuts in any of your research and their historical abundance? <laughs> well, interesting. I did. Uh, yes, in some of the uh, contemporary uh, diaries that I read and uh, or just um, sort of travel books that were written in the time and sold then in Europe to encourage people to come to Canada or settle here. Uh, the, yeah, butternut was mentioned, but ob obviously for whatever reason, it wasn't considered to be a, a tree of financial interest. So it was not mentioned at all in our township, but I know that there are butternuts and historically there have been. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, thank you. Excellent presentation. Many thanks for this interesting talk. I appreciated you identifying, identifying the true purposes of surveys and their less 
salubrious aspects. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. All right. Okay. Well, thank you everyone so much for your time. And thank you again, Sarah, for your time and all of your research. We appreciate you. Um, and so the, the talk um, will be going up onto YouTube if you'd like to share it. Um, probably tomorrow or depending on rural internet, maybe on Tuesday. So we'll, we'll um, um, make note of that when it goes live on our social media for you. Okay. Thanks everybody. That was my, that was my, uh, you know, pandemic passion, uh, number two. So, um, thank you so much for letting me share that information. I, I appreciate that too. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. -bye.